Hey all, I'm back with a podcast, a little change up here on um, non-STEMI versus STEMI and EKGs as a primary focus with a little bit of um, initial treatment ER coming in. I tend to work only in rural areas, so any of these patients get medevac out fairly quickly. But you still need to know um, treatment and recognizing uh, what it is going on, and that's what we'll cover here today. So you have um, this man that comes in, 65 years old, has a significant history of diabetes, smoker, and again, you're in a rural hospital. Um, he's had three hours of chest pressure, also uh, diaphoresis, shortness of breath. Um, so he comes in, you give him aspirin, nitro, uh, chest pain improves, a little bit hypertensive, and his EKG is shown below. So um, his first troponin also was positive. So you can see by looking at the EKG, there's really nothing diagnostic on it. But you have a positive troponin, and the history is uh, very significant. So this person obviously uh, would be diagnosed with an uh, NSTEMI. And um, here's the EKG. The, um, to be diagnosed as a STEMI, you need to have at least one millimeter of um, ST elevation in uh, two consecutive leads. So here we can see, and you see where I have the J point marked. That's right where the QRS meets the ST segment. That's where you um, count the ST elevation from. So even though you're looking at lead two, you might at a glance think, oh, that might be a little bit of ST elevation. If you look at the J point, it's really not. It's the ST segment is right on line with the um, um, end of the QRS there. So there's no ST elevation here anywhere. So that pretty much rules out a STEMI, STEMI and rules in an NSTEMI, unless it develops into STEMI later, obviously, but we're not going to go there today. So what do you can do for an NSTEMI? You're gonna, you want to relieve the ischemic pain, obviously. We've already given him nitro. We gave him aspirin um, when he came, first came in as well. You want to manage his hypertension, tachycardia, and um, obviously beta blockers and nitro um, for this. Beta blockers reduce um, oxygen consumption and um, decrease damage, shown to reduce mortality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Antithrombotic therapy, um, aspirin and um, uh, P2Y12s like Plavix or um, any of the other ones. Uh, anticoagulation for an NSTEMI. Um, the latest recommendations I've seen is not to give heparin, but to use um, um, Lovenox or any other type of low molecular weight uh, heparin that you prefer. And of course, a beta blocker, which I mentioned before, um, has a lot of benefits, reducing mortality, etc. Oxygen, um, the recommendation here is, you know, the old Mona has kind of gone out the window. Uh, morphine, oxygen, um, nitro, aspirin. Um, you only give oxygen if the saturation is less than 93 or anywhere around there. Uh, nitroglycerin still, either sublingual or um, IV. Uh, if you have to give an analgesic, um, morphine is still probably the gold standard, although I prefer it a lot of it. I think it has, um, it's a much cleaner drug. Um, but only if the patient really has an unacceptable level of pain and you're not uh, getting a handle on it with the um, nitroglycerin. Um, the Crusade study, as well as a couple others, have shown a, a higher mortality when morphine is used. Obviously, again, consider beta blockers, aspirin, um, P2Y12s, and low molecular weight heparin as well. And on to a STEMI. A STEMI, um, a little more complicated, you break it down. Uh, either PCI or thrombolysis. Again, we're in a rural area, so it's really difficult to get this patient uh, to a cath lab within 90 minutes. We have to medevac them out, and it's uh, 90 miles down the road. So uh, obviously we get flight here, but even so, um, it's rare. we're rare, rarely able to meet that. And I'll be the first to admit, when I get a patient in with either an NSTEMI or STEMI, I get cardiology on the phone right away. They're absolutely fantastic at where I'm at. And you can get to them within minutes. I let them guide 
what I do anyway. Not to say you shouldn't know how to do it because you do, and you need to be able to diagnose it and get the treatments going while you're um, getting cardiology on the phone. So enough of that soapbox. So if it's within 12 hours and you're able to get them to a cath lab within 90 minutes, then you want to do the, of course, aspirin, um, Plavix, heparin. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, consider beta blockers. If it's within 12 hours and um, PCI is not available within 90 minutes, then you want to switch over and use a thrombolytic, and that should be given within 30 minutes. And um, whichever your ER stocks and your preference is, with guidance from cardiology, and um, we have a nice um, set of orders that I pull out and checkbox, and literally it's done within minutes. So we have it down to pretty much a science here. So on to some EKGs. This EKG obviously has issues, and you can see, see if my pen's gonna work here. Yes, so two, three, AVF for elevated. You see V1, V2, and even V3 has a little bit of issues. So you know, two, three AVF is inferior wall MI. You see some reciprocal changes in your lateral leads, one in ABL. Uh, V6. So you have elevation, that's the inferior wall you're looking at, but you also have some elevation over here in V1, V2, a little bit in V3. And you get to looking closer and you see lead 3, the ST elevation is higher than lead 2. That along with the ST elevation of V1, V2 tells you this is probably going to be a right uh, ventricular infarct. And this is really important to know, obviously, because you're going to want to avoid. Um, uh, nitrates, and you're probably going to end up having to uh, fluid load these patients some. Uh, they're very preload dependent. Next EKG, uh, you can see this one has issues as well. Looks like some ST elevation in one. Looks like some in two. Sorry about that. And AVF, so a little bit of early in three as well. You notice two ST elevation is higher than three, so you're fairly sure it's not a um, RV infarct. Some here in um, V6. So you know lateral is also involved, so you have inferior lateral. But then you look here, V1, V2, V3, and if you put this up to a mirror, it would look just like ST elevation. That's what I used to do back in the old days. Um, now you can get um, um, either V7, V8, V9, or V4R, etc. Uh, to diagnose a posterior wall MI as well. So this patient really has a lot of involvement here. You have inferior, you have lateral, and you have some posterior as well. And this is the same patient as the last one, except they put the leads on the back and got V7, V8, V9. And you can see the elevation here. And I would also want to get a, a um, R4R as well. But, I mean, this is pretty pretty classic anyway, so. And another EKG, you can see ST elevation here in one. And some in ABL, and quite a bit in V4, V5, V6, V3, V2. And so these are your anterior leads and your lateral leads. So this tells you that you're gonna that the patient's having anterior lateral MI. You see a little bit of reciprocal change here in, in lead three. Uh, not much in AVF, a little bit in lead two, not much. But one um, AVL V6, V5 lateral, and of course anterior V2, V3, V4. I also say septal, but anyway, he's having a pretty good MI. Uh, STEMI equivalents, let's talk about these a little bit. You have Wellens, uh, DeWinters, um, AVRST elevation, and also Scarbosa. So this is Wellens, 
and Wellens, you look and um, this is very significant obviously and what Wellens is you get um, inverted or biphasic T waves um, V2, V3 and then this is um, very specific for stenosis of your LAD and obviously that's not a good thing um, they can have chest pain and then may become pain-free could be because a clot clears or the aspirin or whatever um, but this um, these patients require PCI invasive therapy because it is a STEMI, STEMI equivalent. I do want to mention there's two types, um, type A and type B. And um, I've heard a rumor of a type C, but it's just a rumor. So anyway, um, type A, you get a, a biphasic inversion. And type B, you have the deep inverted T waves in um, V2, V3. And again, these patients are STEMI, STEMI equivalent and need to head off the cath lab. Next, uh, the Winters T waves. And um, uh, this is an anterior STEMI equivalent. You don't have any obvious um, ST elevation in your anterior leaves, but you do have kind of a sloping ST depression and very peaked uh, T waves in your precordial leads. And this is fairly rare. If I remember right, it's um, down around 2% and um, usually represents uh, LAD occlusion. The um, tall prominent uh, T waves kind of give it away. And of course, the upsloping ST segments. I'll find my pen. You can see how these ST segments here kind of upslope. And it's um, a little more pronounced here. And then you have these high peak T waves. That's pretty classic. And you also have um, inverted um, ST segment T wave over there in bleed three, which adds to the concern. So this is a STEMI equivalent, and um, patients should um, obviously head to the cath lab as well. Um, if you have a cath lab, if you're in a rural area like me, then you would um, do the um, thrombolytic therapy and transfer as well, of course. AVL, AVR elevation. And you can see um, that AVR right here has a nice elevation of the ST segment going on. And looks like some depression here. So this is a STEMI equivalent and also needs to head to the cath lab. Um, sometimes you get a little bit of ST elevation in B1 as well. This usually represents an LAD occlusion. Um, they can have pretty severe disease. And with this, um, you can see they have pretty diffuse ischemia going on as well. So again, this patient would be either treated and shipped or Hit the cath lab if you have time. And on to the more complicated one, Scarbosa um, or Scarbosa Smith criteria. I'm going to try to make this one as simple as I can. And um, basically, this gives you a way to diagnose a STEMI in the presence of a left bundle branch block or a pacemaker rhythm. Um, of course, any new left bundle you want to be concerned about. But a normal, with a normal bundle or normal pacemaker rhythm, you have uh, the ST segments and T waves um, termed as discordant, meaning that they're directed opposite the latter part of the QRS. You see this QRS is positive, and this um, ST segment and T wave is the opposite direction or negative. And same thing here, you have the QRS, which is negative, but you have the ST segment and the T wave directed positive. And that's normal. That's what you want to see with a, a left bundle branch block or a pacemaker rhythm. Scarbosa's criteria, you can see here you have a positive QRS, but you also have a positive ST segment and T wave. And that's called um, concordant 
and that's not good. And this is um, where they came up with the scarbosis criteria. And you can see here the negative QRS and the negative ST segment, which is which also meets criteria. The old this here is kind of old. I'm going to ignore it. Greater than five millimeters. I know some people still go by that, but the latest um, things coming out saying that might be a little, um, little much, and they have a, go more by ratios now, which we'll get into a little bit. So here's a um, a nice little guideline. So you get a patient that comes to the left bundle branch block. Um, he's stable. Um, if you do the Scarbosa score, it's greater than three, then off to PCI, or they get fibril fibrinolytics. If it's um, less than that, then you look at the ST-S ratio, which I have over at the right here, and if it's less than negative 0.25, then you'll do serial EKGs. Um, I'm sorry, if it is, then you go on the primary PCI and fibrinolytics. If it's not, then you'll do serial EKGs and rule them out. With serial troponins, etc. Make a decision normal, then fine. If it's abnormal, then off to the cath lab they go. We'll start again. So this is the 12 lead um, with a scarbosa um, um, criteria on it. And you can see that this is a pacemaker rhythm. And this works for both pacemaker and left bundle branch blocks. You can see the pacemaker spikes and all these various leads. And um, right here, you can see this is the latter part of the QRS. So um, in discordant um, T wave, this T ST segment should be directed opposite, and it's not. You can see it's directed negatively. And we have a negative end part of the QRS and a negative ST segment. Here is a big example. So here is the negative QRS, but you have a negative ST segment. And this is concordant um, um, reaction. It should be disconcordant. In a normal bundle branch block, you have the bundle, and the ST segment should be directed opposite like that. If you have a bundle and the ST segment is in the same direction or concordant, that's bad. And that means that there's a scheming process going on, MI, etc. And you can look at all the various, a lot of these various leads. The latter part of the QRS is negative and ST segment is negative. Again, that's concordancy. So over in here, um, kind of hard to tell, not so much, but in any case, you can see it there. And that's what Scarbosa criteria is for. And sorry I left this uh, EKG out. I'm not sure what happened because uh, I went through and talked and marked it up, but it just didn't make it to the recording somehow. So again, I hope this helps. Um, any questions, I'm happy to answer them online. Thanks. Bye.